Donald Trump has selected Robert F. Kennedy Jr. to lead the Department of Health and Human Services, the United States' top health agency. On the 20th of January, RFK Jr. claimed that the Trump White House would advise all U.S. water systems to remove fluoride. He pointed to serious alleged risks, including arthritis, bone fractures, cancer, IQ loss, neurodevelopment disorders, and thyroid disease. That's a worrying list, but how accurate is it? In this video, we'll take a deep dive into fluoride's history, its scientific backing, and whether RFK Jr.'s claims hold any water. Let's start with the problem fluoride was designed to solve, tooth decay. Believe it or not, tooth decay is the second most common physical malady in the world, just behind the common cold. And cavities aren't just a cosmetic issue, they can cause severe infections that may spread into the bloodstream and lead to heart or respiratory problems. Thankfully, tooth decay is preventable. Good oral hygiene, regular dental visits and professional care are essential, but fluoride has also been a game changer. It helps protect teeth by strengthening enamel and reducing cavities, especially in populations with less access to regular dental care. To understand how fluoride helps, we need a quick science lesson. Tooth enamel, the hard outer layer of teeth, is made up mostly of a mineral called hydroxypatite. Unfortunately, hydroxypatite isn't very resistant to acid. Bacteria in your mouth, like streptococcus mutans, feed on sugar and produce acids that attack enamel, leading to cavities. This is where fluoride comes in. When it's present, whether in water, toothpaste or topical treatments, it interacts with tooth enamel to form fluoropatite, a compound that's much more resistant to acid. Fluoride doesn't just strengthen enamel, it also inhibits the bacteria's ability to produce harmful acids. These two effects together dramatically reduce the risk of tooth decay. Fluoride's story goes back over a century. In 1901, a dentist named Frederick McKay noticed that people in Colorado Springs had stained mottled teeth, a condition we now call fluorosis. Interestingly, these people had far fewer cavities than other communities. McKay eventually traced this phenomenon back to the high natural fluoride levels in the local water supply. By the 1940s, researchers confirmed that fluoride in drinking water could significantly reduce tooth decay. In 1945, Grand Rapids, Michigan became the first city to fluoridate its water supply at optimal levels, between 0.7 and 1.2 parts per million. The results were dramatic. Cavity rates fell by 50 to 53%. Other cities quickly followed suit and major health organizations, including the WHO and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, endorsed fluoridation as a public health breakthrough. The CDC estimates that for every dollar spent on fluoridating water, communities save about $38 in dental costs. This is especially beneficial for low income populations where access to dental care is limited. Despite its success, fluoridation has faced fierce opposition from the start. Early critics dismissed fluoride as rat poison or claimed it was part of a communist plot. In recent years, opponents have focused on its industrial origins, noting that hydrofluorosilic acid, the compound used for fluoridation, is a byproduct of fertilizer production. That might sound alarming, but repurposing industrial byproducts for safe use is a common practice. Iodine, for instance, was once considered waste from seaweed processing before it became a vital nutrient to prevent goiters. Anti-fluoridation activists also claim that fluoride causes serious health problems, including cancer, thyroid destruction, and even reduced intelligence. So let's take a closer look at those claims. One genuine concern is fluorosis, a condition caused by excessive fluoride intake during childhood. Mild fluorosis results in white spots on teeth, 
while severe cases associated with much higher fluoride levels than what's found in public water can cause brown stains or pitting. However, severe fluorosis is extremely rare when fluoride levels are kept within the recommended range of 0.7 to 1.2 parts per million. Claims that fluoride causes cancer or thyroid pro problems don't hold up under scientific scrutiny. Numerous studies have investigated these allegations and no credible evidence has been found linking fluoride at recommended levels to systemic health issues. In 2006, the US National Research Council did recommend lowering the maximum allowable fluoride concentration in areas with naturally high levels to prevent severe fluorosis. But this wasn't due to any new concerns about cancer or thyroid dysfunction. Perhaps the most widely discussed concern is fluoride's alleged effect on intelligence. A 2019 study published in JAMA Pediatrics suggested a link between higher maternal fluoride intake during pregnancy and a slightly lower IQ score in male children. However, there are significant issues with this study. It relied on estimates of fluoride intake rather than direct measurements and didn't control for critical variables like maternal IQ or environmental pollutants. Subsequent analyses have questioned the study's conclusions, suggesting that even if there is a small effect, it's likely insignificant compared to other prenatal risks like tobacco exposure, lead poisoning, or poor nutrition. Leading health organizations, including the American Dental Association, continue to support fluoridation based on decades of research showing its safety and effectiveness. As the famous toxicologist Paracelsus once said, the dose makes the poison. That's the key point here. At extremely high levels, fluoride can be harmful, just like most substances, including water itself. But at the levels used in the public water system, fluoride's benefits far outweigh any potential risks. So, should we remove fluoride from public water systems as RFK Jr. suggests? Based on the evidence, the answer is clear, no. Fluoride has played a vital role in reducing cavities, especially in communities with limited access to dental care. It's one of the most cost-effective public health measures in history, saving millions in dental costs and preventing untold suffering from tooth decay. This video was based on an essay written by Henry I. Miller, a physician and molecular biologist and distinguished fellow at the American Council on Science and Health. It was published in Quillette on the 11th of December, 2024. You can read the full article and explore more thought-provoking content at quillette.com. Thank you for watching. And if you found this video insightful, don't forget to like and subscribe for more deep dives into politics, science, and public health. Stay curious and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching. I've been Zoe Booth.